questions primarily. I actually have divided chapter 17 into two parts just because it's too much for one chapter. So in a lot of other textbooks do that besides Brown and LeMay. Uh, so in this chapter, we'll talk mainly about uh, uh, buffer solutions first, and then we'll talk about the HH equation or what I call the HH equation. Uh, the technical name for it is Hazel, Hazelwood Hasselbalch, <clears throat> but it takes too long to say all that. So I just call it the HH equation. And then we'll go ahead and start the titration set. So uh, for this chapter, uh, this part, this video, we'll talk about the first two titrations, which will be uh, strong acid, strong base, and then uh, weak acid, strong base. And then there's another part, a part two for this uh, chapter that deals with the other titrations that uh, are involved in, in the set. So there's actually only three different ones that are mainly looked at. And that's strong, strong, weak, strong, and then weak base, strong acid. And then in the second part of this video, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, just for a moment, we'll talk about uh, weak acid, weak base titrations and why they're very difficult. And then also polyprotic. I'll just introduce that. Okay, so the credits for this chapter is always uh, Brown and LeMay's chemistry and also Zumdahl's chemistry. Uh, is, uh, very significant contributions from both of those. Let's go ahead and move on next. Uh, so uh, next slide, we've already talked about this. Next, uh, uh, okay, so and then the commentary here is provided by myself. Uh, so what I'm going to do in order to keep this from getting way long is I'm going to uh, probably go a little quickly. But since this is going up on YouTube, you can just pause it. I know it's kind of a pain in the neck to do that, but uh, that's probably what you're going to have to do because otherwise this thing's liable to get very long because it can take a long time to explain this stuff. So, I mean, it may go two hours even the fact with the fact that I'm going kind of quickly. All right, so let's move on. Uh, so here we already talked about what we're going to talk about. Let's move on. So the common ion effect... Uh, is let me just explain it before we start going through the slides. So we've talked about uh, equilibria up to this point, Ka and Kb equilibria, where you just start with only a weak acid, for example. Let's just use that uh, for our example. So you would, for example, start with formic acid or acetic acid or HF or any other weak acid and add water to it. And remember our assumptions. Our assumptions are for that kind of a scenario. It would be that uh, we don't have any of the conjugate base when we first start out. So the difference here, uh, and this is called the common ion effect, and the solution that's produced, if you want to write this down, um, by a common ion effect is called a buffer solution. So if you've ever taken bufferin, uh, that's buffered aspirin. Aspirin is a very weak acid, and so that means it's buffered so that it kind of like diminishes the effect it would have on your stomach. <clears throat> okay, so the difference, and I want you to understand this before we even start looking at this stuff. The difference is that for a buffered solution, you're not just starting, as in this case, with just the weak acid. Okay, it's not just the acid as we've been doing. It's also roughly uh, an equivalent amount of bases in there. So, for example, if you had 0.5 molar acid, acetic acid or whatever, then rather than to start it out with zero for the conjugate base, so, what, so what's the conjugate base of acetic acid? Well, it's what's left over from acetic acid when you give up, when it gives up a proton. So CH3COOH produces CH3COO minus, and that CH3COO minus is called acetate. So acetic acid produces acetate. So for these problems that we're going to do starting now <clears throat> and for the next little bit, we're going to be talking about solutions where we have already put in a whole bunch of the acetate. In other words, it's not zero when we start out. In fact, if it were 0.5 molar acetic acid, then we might just put in 0.5 molar acetate. So in other words, it kind of like once you start this reaction, it's not really going to move very much. <clears throat> and this has a profound effect because what it's going to do is it's going to slow the forward direction of this equilibrium. In other words, there's no uh, particular reason for it to go forward anymore because it's already basically at equilibrium. <clears throat> 
uh, so it won't really do much of anything. Now, if you add an acid to that, so this is what happens in your blood. If you add an acid to your blood, it has a built-in buffer. It's not like the one I just discussed, but uh, and so if it gets acid added into it accidentally, then it has the ability to keep the pH of your blood within a certain very narrow range, and that's necessary because if it doesn't stay within that range, then you start to lose the ability uh, to do some of the chemical reactions in your body that you need to do. So the difference, again, just be sure you understand this. The difference between what we've done up to this point and what we're going to do now is that we are starting out with some of the conjugate base. It's not zero. OK, so let's go ahead and move on. Uh, so this effect is called the common ion effect. Let me get my marker working here. So this is called the common ion effect. And when you have that, the solution is called a buffer solution. Now, this is the way that we're going to study in our class that you can kind of slow down uh, an equilibrium in the forward direction. Or in other words, what you're doing is you're basically uh, decreasing the amount of dissociation. So let me just say at this point, we're not going to talk about it until much later. But just to plant the idea in your minds, We'll also discuss later on a couple of ways that you can actually increase the forward rate of an equilibrium. And there's a couple of them, and I'll just mention the names now. One way is just to add an, a strong acid to the product, and that will remove some of the product out of the equilibrium, which will shift it to the right. You don't have to remember that now. Another way is to add something that's called a ligand. And it will produce a complex ion, which I know you don't understand what that means right now, and don't worry about it. But uh, it will also have the effect that it will remove product and shift the equilibrium to the right. But that's for later. Okay, let's go on. So here's an example where we're starting off with HCN, hydrocyanic acid, and that's a weak acid. Notice this is a Ka expression. So we can set up whatever the Ka value is, which I mean, typically we would be given that or might be given that, or you could look it up possibly in the literature. But it is a Ka expression just to review because we're adding a weak acid to water or vice versa. And uh, the weak acid is donating its proton to water to make H3O+. Plus. So what we're doing here is we're actually decreasing the rate of that happening. So notice here over here, we've got the Cn minus. This is the conjugate base of HCn. It's what's left of HCN after it donates a proton. So up to this point, for this right here, we've been putting zero. And I've been saying, unless they tell you otherwise, OK, put zero. But here, we're, we're being told otherwise, right? So let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> uh, OK, so this is called the common ion effect. <clears throat> and the uh, statement here is that if you have a solution of the weak acid, which is this, plus its conjugate base, which is actually C and minus, which will then like uh, pair up with Na plus, right? But we don't care really about the Na plus here. It won't be as acidic as it would be if we just started off with the weak acid. Next slide. <clears throat> so here's the important take home lesson. When you have a buffered solution, and when do you have a buffered solution? When you have this common ion effect. And what this means is that in that equilibrium, let me just explain what they mean by common ion effect. In the equilibrium, CH3COOH plus H2O gives H3O plus plus CH3COO minus. Then you have already in that equilibrium CH3COO minus. It's just that there won't be very much of it. So when you dump a bunch of CH3COO minus into your solution at the start, you're adding something that was already in the equilibrium. In other words, you're donating a common ion. In other words, you're putting something into that that's already there. You're just increasing the uh, concentration of it. So that's where they get the term common ion. <clears throat> in that case, the common ion would be the CH3COO minus. So uh, let's come down to the second paragraph. They are weak acids or bases. So for right now, we're going to concentrate on just doing it for weak acids because that's enough. And then uh, you can also do it for weak bases. And we'll do that later. That's actually going to be in part two of the video. 
uh, containing a common ion, which we just explained. And then after you make this buffer, then the, the whole point of it is that it will resist changes in pH. So you can dump HCl or NaOH in there, which is strong S and strong base, and it really doesn't change the pH. So it's like a protective measure that this solution has to keep the pH from changing very much. Next slide. So I'm, I'm actually, like uh, I usually do, I'm actually kind of going a little slower than I needed to. So I may have to try to speed up a little bit. <clears throat> so in working common ion buffer problems, we have to do these a little bit differently. So what we're going to have to do is before we do our equilibrium ice table, so we'll still be doing the ice table. But before we do that, we have to do something where we can figure out what concentrations we should put in to the ice table. So in order to do that, what we have to do is basically this. We have to find the best acid and the best base, and sometimes that can be a little challenging. Uh, in some cases, the best acid or base may even be water. But whatever it is, we have to find the best acid and the best base and react them together until one of them eats the other one all up. In other words, until one of them is completely gone. Now, when you're at the equivalence point, they're both going to be gone, and that's a special problem. So we'll talk about that later. But otherwise, in all the other points, you're going to have... Uh, some of the acid and some of the base, and then also with the exception, when you first start out, right? When you first start out, you won't have any of the base, uh, depending on the problem. So, I mean, we're, now we're, for this kind of a problem here, we, we would have it. But, I mean, I'm talking about later when we do the titrations. All right. So, anyway, you do the stoichiometry first. Uh, and then once you do that, you're going to be given a set of numbers that you're left over with. And these are going to be numbers of moles. So this is what I was talking about before when I said that in some of the uh, later parts of the course that we would talk about tables like ice tables. But instead of having the numbers meaning moles per liter, I said they would just mean number of moles. And that's what I was talking about. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. Uh, and then uh, they're saying that we're going to look at an example. So let's go to the next slide. So take the case in which you have a solution of 0.5 molar acetic acid with 0.5 molar sodium acetate here. So this is the same thing exactly that I talked about a few minutes ago. So notice these concentrations. Notice they are concentrations here. And they're the same. So you're not going to have much going on once you add these things together because they're already almost at equilibrium. Uh, then we, they give us the Ka for acetic acid, which hopefully you've got memorized by now. <clears throat> if you don't, you might want to just do it because it may save you some time. Uh, so let's move on to the next slide. Let you read that on your own. So here uh, is this. What kind of a table is this? Well, this is just the regular old ice table. So we're going to, what we're doing right now is actually we're kind of introducing the topic of titrations and just kind of playing around with it a little bit. And then later on, we'll actually start doing them. Uh, okay, so the dominant equilibrium, we already know we're taking a weak acid and adding what? What do you always add in a Ka expression? Water, right? And why do we need it to be a Ka expression? Well, because if it is a Ka expression, then we can take the Ka value that we can look up somewhere and set it equal to the equilibrium expression. <laughs> um, but also, it has to be at equilibrium, right? So what we can't use the value here at the top. We have to use the value down here at the bottom. Okay, so, uh, so what we're doing here, what's different about this? Well, mainly that right there, the thing that I'm circling right now, is 0 0.5. What's it been up to this point? Basically, it's been 0, right? So we wind up here with 0 0.5 plus x, and here we wind up with 0 0.5 minus x. But if we assume that x is negligible, it's just 0 0.5 divided by 0 0.5. Next slide. So that's what we're going to get right here. We're going to get the Ka, which is 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth, equals uh, approximately 1. This is approximately 1 here times x. Or in other words, Ka just equals x. Uh, <clears throat> or in other words, x equals Ka. Um, so we're going to we're going to remember this. It's important. So uh, whenever we have a situation like this, we wind up with our x being the same. It's just the Ka value. So that means that the Ka uh, value is going to equal 1.80 minus 5. So x is going to equal 
8 equal, it was uh, e minus 5 here. Sorry, uh, got tongue tied there. So uh, that means that when you look at the chart and follow x back up to the top, you see that at the x, as usual, is the concentration of H3O plus. So that means if we take minus the log of that, which is another way to say that would be if we take the P uh, Ka, then it will give us the pH. <clears throat> In other words, the pH will equal pKa, um, and that only happens when these concentrations are exactly the same. So when we have a situation where you've got the same concentration of acid and its conjugate base, pH equals pKa. Let's go ahead and move on. All right, let's uh, say now that we're going to add 0.01 moles of NaOH, very strong base to one liter of the buffer solution and they're talking about that same buffer solution that we just saw on those previous slides back there so let's add 0 0.1 moles of NaOH <clears throat> uh, so because this is a very strong base then it should uh, make the pH go way up and just to give you a ballpark figure it should make it go up to about 12 but let's see what happens so first of all, this is uh, do the stoichiometric calculations, which that really won't mean much to you until you do a few examples. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, and then they're going through the major species. So let's just do this real quickly. Uh, so we're adding sodium hydroxide. So sodium hydroxide, we always have water. And then we already had this CH3COO minus here. Remember, we added that at the very beginning, so that was different. And then, of course, we have our acetic acid because that's what we're dealing with here. Uh, however, which ones of these are going to be major species? So in the past, this hasn't been a major species, right? Because it does this over here doesn't really dissociate that much if you start off with it because it's weak acid. But in this case, this will be a major species, right? Because you put a whole bunch of it in there. Okay, so that's different. Let's go on to the next slide. Uh, and then I'm going to go ahead and let you look at this one on your own. So you'll want to pause here if you want to read this. Next slide. All right, so these are what we call the stoichiometric calculations. They're kind of like ice tables, but you're not putting in the molarity. You're putting in just the number of moles. And we want to use our best acid and our best base. And we want to react them together until one of them runs out, which in this case is going to be the OH minus because it's present in a lower quantity than the CH3COOH. Notice here, once we've done this, we wind up with zero left here. So what we're going to look at is just the number of moles. So we remember from the problem statement that we added 0.01 mole of OH minus, we started off with one liter of 0.5 moles per liter of CH3COOH. So moles per liter times liter is going to give us the number of moles, right? So 0.5 times 1 is just 0.5 moles. So react these two things together. So this is what you do in the stoichiometric calculations. First of all, you're writing the number of moles, not the moles per liter. And then you react the best acid out of that list of stuff that we just saw a couple of slides back. Pick out the best acid and the best base. <clears throat> and then react them together until one of them runs out or rarely until they both run out. And if that happens, you're at the equivalence point. So what we would do then is we would subtract 0.01 moles from both the CH3COOH and also the OH minus. So 0.5 over here minus 0.01 leaves 0.49. And then over here, 0.01 minus 0.01 is 0. So now we've uh, eliminated this, and, and all we're doing is we're simulating what happens when we, we actually do this in a, in a beaker or whatever. So that's what would happen. The best acid will always react with the best base until one of them runs out or both of them run out. Okay, so we've changed it a little bit because every time we add a mole of this to a mole of this, we produce a mole of that over here. And so how many moles did we add? Well, we added 0.01. So we take away 0 0.01 from this side over here, and then we add 0 0.01 moles to this side. So now we don't have 0.5 over here. We have 0.51. Over here we have 0.49. So we just changed it a little bit. Uh, so let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, and I've already talked about this, so let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> 
So now what we're going to do is we're going to migrate those two values over into the ice table. Uh, so, uh, and also we'll notice here that for our major species that we still have, we lack the OH minus here because it disappeared. It was eaten all up by the CH3COOH. Now, let me just point this out now before we move to the next slide. This stuff right here, in turn, would have eaten up any, uh, uh, let's see, actually, this is what this is what was going to, well, let's just go on to the next slide, and I'll talk about it later. Next slide. All right, so now, what we have left is a, a solution that has water. So let me just mark these as I say them, and then acetic acid, and then we also have the acetate. <clears throat> so what are we going to write across the top of the ice table? Well, we always write what across the top of an ice table? We write the most dominant reaction or equilibrium. We always have the possibility that we could write the auto dissociation of water across the top, which would be H2O plus H2O gives OH minus plus H3O plus, but we never do that, basically. <clears throat> I mean, it's possible uh, that you could do that, but uh, that would only happen if you have extremely low concentrations of an added acid or base. And so we really don't even do problems like that. So for our purposes, that's never going to be the one that we write across the top. So in this case, our equilibrium is going to be the other possibility. And remember, what we do to find these different possibilities is we match up the things that are left over, like uh, we could match up water with itself, which is what I just did. Uh, we were left over with CH3COOH, which we can add to water. <clears throat> and we also were left over with CH3COO minus and water. We, we could add those together. So let me just say this before we go on. You could do this problem two different ways. You could do it the way it is here. Or you could also do it another way where you use the KB for CH3COO minus, which we'll talk about that later on in the part two of this video. So either way you, you do it, you could do it either way and you'd get the same answer. Just to put your mind at rest in case you're worried about that. That's the kind of thing sometimes students worry about. So you could also start off with that over here on the left hand side and add water to that and use a KB expression. So this wouldn't be KA of 1.8 E minus five. For this one down here, it would be KB, which would be what, 5.56 E minus 10. Okay, so before we click to the next slide, let me just make sure that we talked about, okay, so what are we going to write across the top of our ice table? Well, <clears throat> if we have, let me just underline these, we have this, and we have this, and we have this left over, <clears throat> then we can actually put all three of those things into an equilibrium together if we write this equilibrium that you're looking at right now. Or you could do it the same way by doing it the way that I wrote it at the bottom. Now, I didn't write this one all, all the way out, but this would be plus H2O, and I'm not going to write it, but it would be plus H2O, double-headed arrow, and then on the right you'd have CH3COH plus OH minus, and then you'd have KB equals 5.56E minus 10. So you can do it that way if you want to. It's perfectly okay, and I don't care which way you do it. But for right now, let's just do it this way. And so this is what we write across the top of our ice table. And so we're going to have this kind of like in the middle where our double-headed arrow is. Uh, and we'll have CH3COOH plus H2O. And then we'll have minus X here and plus X over on the right, right? Just as we've always done. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. And so here we go. So this is what you write across the top of the ice table. Now, the reason I keep emphasizing this is because they're not going to tell you in the problems, this is what you should write across the top of your ice table. You have to figure it out. So in this case, it wasn't that difficult because the only other option would have been the H2O plus H2O thing. <clears throat> However, some of these problems, it won't be that easy. And you'll see that as we go through these, the rest of this chapter and then on into 17b. <clears throat> so then what we do is we put initial change in equilibrium, just as we've done in the past. And remember from a few slides back that we figured out that this is now 0.49 moles. And because it was in one liter, fortuitously, we don't have to do any math here. We can just divide it by one, which is going to be just 0.49. Same thing over here with the 
so again, but notice this. I'm going to put a star here. That's not zero. And why is it not zero? Because we put some in at the beginning of this whole uh, process. Uh, so uh, this number right here comes from a few slides back where we did our stoichiometric calculations. Now, in this case, because we had one liter of solution, it was easy to do these. It turned out, actually, if you'll recall, that the number of moles on the stoichiometric uh, chart when we got to equilibrium turns out to be the same number as the molarity <clears throat> that we're putting in here on the top row for initial, right? But it usually won't be that way. So the way you'll usually have to do it is to take the number of moles from your stoichiometric chart and divide it by whatever the total volume is. And so because we're going to see that, I'll go ahead and move on. So again, here's our minus x on the left-hand side. We don't really care about the water, so we just kind of leave that out. And then we have the middle part here. And then on the right here, we're going to say we're going to start off with approximately 0 there. It's actually what? 1 times 10 to the minus 7th uh, plus x. So on the left, we had minus x. So on the right, we have plus x and plus x. So down here, we end up with x. And here, we wind up with 0.51 plus x and here 0.49 minus x. So Ka will equal this times this divided by this. If we assume that the x's are negligible, we wind up with 0.51 times x divided by 0.49. Um, and then that's going to equal Ka. What's Ka for this? So see if you can remember it real quick. 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth, right? So that will equal the concentrations of the products to their coefficient powers divided by the concentrations of the reactants at equilibrium. It's got to be at equilibrium because that K, capital K, stands for an equilibrium constant. It has to be at equilibrium. Next slide. So we wind up here with X <clears throat> times 0.51 times, uh, sorry, divided by 0.49 which if you divide 0.51 by 0.49, you get a little more than 1. Uh, so this is going to equal 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5th. Multiply both sides by 1.04. And you get that x is 1.7. Oh, I believe I said multiply. It should be divide both sides by 1.04. Sorry. <clears throat> and so you would be dividing 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5th by 1.04 uh, and you would get approximately 1.7 times 10 to the minus fifth instead of 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth. In other words, it doesn't really change very much. Now rem remember the X here is your concentration of your H3O plus. So the new pH is going to be minus the log of 1.7 times 10 to the minus fifth, which is 4.76. What would it have been before? Well, it would have been 4.75, right? Uh, it would have been minus the log of 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth up here, which is 4.7475, which we round off to 4.75. So in other words, the pH value only went up from 4.75 to 4.76. That's not very much. Uh, next slide. So here is uh, restating what I just said here. It's only going up <clears throat> from 4.75 to 4.76. If we hadn't had a buffer solution in here, and we added that same number of moles of NaOH, it would have gone up from 7, which is what it would have been originally, right, to 12, which is 5 units. So you can see how incredibly effective this is at keeping the pH from changing very much. Next. So what we basically did was we added OH- minus from the sodium hydroxide, and then this buffer solution just replaced them with acetates which are not nearly as effective in affecting the pH as the OH minus. Next slide. Um, all right, so I'm going to let you look at this one on your own. And really, to tell you the truth, you really don't need to look at this because you're probably never going to see this slide again. So let's go to the next one uh, next. So uh, I'll talk about this for just a moment. So we started off with an original concentration of the acid over the base. And then we added this OH minus here. Whoops, I didn't mean to go right through the middle of it. <clears throat> and we ended up with almost the same ratio. Remember, it went from 1 
to 1.04, so it didn't really change that much. And also, we had quite a bit of the acid in the base here, the acetate and the acetic acid. So that's how it works. Next slide. So let's move on to what we're going to call the HH equation. Let me just write this here on this slide so that if you uh, forget what it means, it's actually henderson hasselbalch I think I spoke, I said that one wrong earlier. It's henderson hasselbalch but we're going to call it HH anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Next slide. <clears throat> All right, so this kind of goes back to what we were saying on those slides I told you to forget about. Uh, this is the HH equation, and we're going to use this one a ton. Now, we can use this equation anytime we have a buffer solution, including, and this gets a little confusing, including when we're doing titrations. So what that means is, if you're doing a titration of a weak acid, strong base, or a, later we'll do weak base, strong acid, if you're between the equivalence point and the start point, then you actually have a buffer solution, and you can use this equation. However, we're going to use it right now just for buffer solutions, but just keep it in mind that when you're doing your titrations later, you can use this, and I'll mention that later. So this is the equation. Let me just kind of tell you what it says and then tell you what the parts are. The pH of your solution can be figured out if you know what the Ka value is for your weak acid, or later it would be your Kb for your weak base. But then you have to convert that back to, for, for a weak base problem, I'm kind of getting ahead a little bit, but we'll do that in part two. But if you had a weak base problem, you would have to convert the Kb to the Ka, uh, then it ha because it has to actually be in this exact form. And then you take the base 10 log of the concentration of the base over the acid. And I re recommend that you remember what I just said. It's the log of the base concentration over the acid, the base over the acid, the base over the acid, because people on exams get under time constraints and they forget and they put the acid over the base every time. So unless you just specifically make it a point to remember this, then you'll forget it. Or you'll, I mean, the best case scenario would be you have to look it up again. <clears throat> so just remember the pH of your solution equals pKa plus the log of the base over the acid, where the base concentration, in the case that we did for the example a few slides back, was what? 0.51, I think, 0.51 molar. So that would have gone on the top, and then the 0.49 here would have gone on the bottom, which is the acetic acid. Uh, the pKa is just, you take the Ka value and then take minus the log of it. Remember, P is our shorthand notation for minus the base 10 log. So, for example, if you have uh, 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth for your Ka for acetic acid, then if you'll type that into your calculator, take the log of it, the base 10 log of it, and then take the negative of that, you get about 4.75. So to get the pH of your solution, you just add 4.75 plus the log of whatever your concentration of your base over your acid is. Next slide. So here's an example. Here our base is here, and its concentration is 0.85. So that would go on top, and the 0.45 is our acid. So that goes on the bottom. So we take the, the well, okay, we take the base 10 log of the ratio of 0.85 over 0.45, which that's just actually a little bit less than two, right? <clears throat> so anyway, take the base 10 log of that and then add that to uh, pKa. So in this case, it's acetic acid, so it's Ka value, which hopefully you've memorized by now is 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth. So the pKa is going to be 4.75 approximately. It's actually 4.7475. But you're perfectly welcome just to round it off to 4.75. So we just answered this question. All we have to do is just do the math of what I just said. Next slide. And now it's starting to mess up on me. So you wind up with 4.745. Um, and then when you take the base 10 log of the 0.85 over 0.45, you get 0.276. Okay, so this is this part is the pKa for acetic acid. So uh, take minus the base 10 log of 1.80 minus 5, uh, which this right here is going to round off to 
Uh, so you, you'll see it a couple of different ways because uh, this textbook that we're using, Brown and LeMay, and I think that's what we used here for this problem, uh, they use, I think, a different, slightly different value for the Ka for acetic acid. But anyway, it, it doesn't really matter. So whatever value you use, you just uh, take minus the base 10 log of your Ka and then take the ratio of your base to your acid concentrations, take the base 10 log of that, and then you add that. You add there, and that's not a minus sign. So you get 4.745 or whatever, 4.75 <clears throat> plus 0.276. And the 0.276 is what you got over here when you did this calculation, and you get 5.02. All right, so that's uh, the first example we've done of doing an HH equation. We have several examples in the work problems of doing this. <clears throat> All right, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so I'll let you look at this slide on your own, but it's basically showing here in the middle. If you start off with roughly a one-to-one -one ratio of your base to your acid, then it doesn't matter whether you go this way and add a base like NaOH or whether you go this way <clears throat> and add a strong acid like, for example, HCl. Either way you do it, you don't change the pH very much because you don't change this ratio very much. Or in the case of adding an acid, you don't change that ratio right there very much. Do you see that? So that's the secret of buffers is it keeps the ratio of the acid to the, or the base to the acid almost constant. Next slide. <clears throat> so buffers contain relatively large concentrations of a weak acid and its corresponding conjugate base. Uh, if we add H+, plus, in other words, if we add like sulfuric acid or, or hydrochloric acid, it will react to completion here. In other words, it will be eliminated. And so the pH change here would be minimal. And the same thing here if we add the OH-, minus, which we just saw that. Next slide. <clears throat> so again, we just said this. The pH in the buffered solution is determined by the ratio of the base to the acid. As long as this stays about the same, the pH will also stay about the same. Next slide. The buffering capacity refers to how much uh, acid or base you can add without making the pH change significantly. And they don't really define what they mean by that. But in other words, it, it would have to be something where it's too much for your system to handle. So I guess it probably depends on the system. Uh, and it's determined by the magnitudes of the concentrations. In other words, what they're saying here is the higher the concentration of the weak acid conjugate base, then the more buffering capacity it's going to have. I don't think I've ever seen a question on this with uh, uh, any of the exams, but it's always possible that it could show up on a final as a multiple choice. Next. So optimal buffering is going to occur when the concentration of the acid and the conjugate base are about the same. We've already said that. Next. Uh, and then there's a little rule. If you're going to choose a buffer, a buffer solution, you want the pKa of the weak acid. The pKa of the weak acid is just you find the weak acids, find a list of them, look at the values of their Ka. They, they are listed in various places in the literature and in your textbook. <clears throat> and then do the pKa's for them. You can just tell by looking at the exponents of the Ka's about what the pKa would be. Uh, so like if you're trying to want, get one that uh, would be at pH 5, then you would want something about uh, 10 to the minus fifth, right? Because then that would give you minus a minus 5, which is a plus 5. And there uh, was a problem like this in the work problems, but I may have actually pulled it out for, for this class. Next slide. <clears throat> OK, now what we'll talk about next is not actually a titration set. It's just to kind of get us introduced to it. So let's go to the next slide. So a titration curve is when we plot the pH. And on the y-axis, we're going to put the pH with 7 right in the middle. And then on the x-axis, we'll be doing the progress of the reaction, if you want to look at it that way. Or in other words, how much of the uh, base that we're adding, for example, if we're titrating acetic acid with NaOH, then across the x-axis, we'll just add, uh, you know, this is how many milliliters of NaOH we added. So it starts at zero and goes. The equivalence point 
would be when you have added exactly enough NaOH to neutralize the acetic acid that you started with or whatever acid. Uh, so again, this is going to be, let me just give a little sketch up here at the top right. So here's a graph. And uh, for example, if you're starting with a weak acid and then you're adding a base, you're going to be starting like if seven is like right here. Uh, so this is going to be the pH over on the y-axis. And then your progress of reaction will be where you'll be starting. I mean, the pH originally will be about here. It won't be real low down here because this is a weak acid, not... <clears throat> A strong acid right and then it will come up like this and then it will end up like that and somewhere where this curve stops increasing in slope and starts decreasing like maybe right there is your equivalence point so this is a titration curve this thing that I just drew and your pH is going to be on the left hand side on your y-axis Okay, so we'll see some examples of that. So let's go on. So here's another picture. I guess I could have saved myself the trouble. Uh, so here we're titrating a strong acid, nitric acid, with a strong base. So uh, if we do that, when we get to the equivalence point, we'll actually be at pH 7 every time. And that's one of the rules we're going to learn when we get to the first titration set. Uh, so um, the one that I drew on the previous slide was not like this. It was a weak acid strong base. So the pH at the equivalence point will not be 7 for the one that I drew on the previous slide. But whenever you have any of the weak, I'm sorry, any of the strong bases titrated with any of the strong acids, uh, your equivalence point will always come at 7. And you'll see that's what's happening here. So here we started off just with a strong acid. Notice the pH was very low because this is a strong acid. Okay, so the pH is going to be like one, depending on how concentrated it is or two or whatever. It depends on the concentration. Remember, we said it could even be negative, right? But we're not going to worry about that right now. Uh, and then as you start to add base, like you'll notice here, when you added 50 milliliters here, then uh, the pH came up a little bit. And then when you added 100 milliliters of this base, and let's look back up here, we have 0.1 molar base. And when we added 100 milliliters or 0.1 liters of that, we would have added 0.1 times 0.1 would be 0.01 moles of NaOH, which is exactly what we started with with the acid, right? Uh, 0.2 moles per liter times 0.05 liters, that would be 0.01. So once you've added exactly the same amount of base that you started with of the acid, you're at the equivalence point. Again, if you happen to be doing a strong acid, strong base titration, then the equivalence point will be 7. The pH will be 7. So again, just to kind of repeat what I said earlier, we're going to talk about in this part one, we're going to talk about strong acid, strong base titrations, and we're going to talk about weak acid strong base titrations. And then in part two, we'll talk about weak base, strong acid titrations. And then just for a moment, we'll touch on why we usually don't do titrations where you're using a weak acid and a weak base. And the reason is because it's very difficult to do. All right, next slide. And then here we have another one where we're starting off here with just the base. So if it's a pure base like H, uh, sorry, NaOH, uh, your pH is going to be very high at the beginning and then it's going to drop. But again, notice if it's a strong acid, strong base titration, doesn't matter which one you're titrating with the other one, your equivalence point will still be at 7. Next slide. Okay, so weak acid, strong base titrations, which we'll also do in part 1, we have to do these kind of like what we did before when we were talking about buffers. We have to use a stoichiometry problem first and take the best acid and react it with the best base until one of them is all gone. And then figure out at equilibrium, or not at equilibrium, figure out after you do that, figure out how many moles of each you have left. And one of them is going to be zero, obviously. Uh, and then you'll want to figure out how many moles you have left of the weak acid and its conjugate base. Uh, and then most of the time, you'll have to then divide that by your total volume to get the moles per liter. 
or molarity, and then you'll transfer that or migrate that into your ice table at the top of the ice table. And that's what they mean when they see an equilibrium problem. So don't let that confuse you. When they say an equilibrium problem, they just mean an ice table where you're figuring out what the equilibrium concentrations are going to be. Next. So we're not going to go through these problems that we have coming up in the next few slides completely. We're just going to use these as kind of like a way to show you how to do various things. So for example, here, if we have 0.1 moles of HCN and we're given the Ka value and we have added 0.04 moles of NaOH, what's the first thing we're going to do here? Okay, well, I mean, just for your information, when you're doing these on a test, you probably won't want to waste a lot of time going through all of these steps. You need to know how to do them. And I mean, you may be asked the, this kind of questions rarely, <clears throat> but I mean, I wouldn't spend a ton of time, but okay, let's just answer this question. What are the major species as soon as you mix these up? Well, so can you tell me, you're going to always have water. And then you're in this case, you're going to have Na plus and OH minus because that's a strong base and it breaks up completely. But what about this? So really, this is what they're asking. Will we have HCN left the way it is? Or will we have H plus and CN minus? And the answer is because HCN is a weak acid, it will stay together mostly. A little bit will dissociate, but not very much. So it's mostly going to stay as HCN. So the major species are going to be H2O, HCN, Na plus and OH minus. Let's go ahead and just go through this with them. So let's go to the next slide. If I can get this thing to flip. There we go. Okay, so what we just said, uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, all right, and so these questions I'll let you look at for the sake of time on your own, so you can pause here if you want. Ah, okay, but before I flip, what are the possibilities for the dominant reaction? And what they're going to do here is what they always do, and they're, they're like really thorough about this, and that's good because it shows you what you should do ideally. But again, when you're doing these on an exam, you're probably not going to go through every one of these. You're probably just going to say which is the best base and which is the best acid. But let's just play along with it. So our major species, just from memory, because I can't back up, are going to be Na plus, OH minus, H2O, and HCN. <clears throat> um, so what they'll do for this question they're asking here is they'll just match up all of those. Like, for example, what about if you have H2O plus H2O? What if you have H2O plus uh, HCN? Well, I mean, you could have that, but the only way that would happen would be you know, under un unusual circumstances. What about if you have OH minus an HCN? Well, that's the best acid and best base. So that's what we want. So what you need to do is you, you try to understand what they're doing here with all of these like really exhaustive uh, processes they go through. Try to understand it. But for the problems on a test, hopefully you'll by that time be to the point where you can say to yourself, okay, we need the best acid, the best base. What's the best base here? Do you remember? it would be the OH minus, right? And what, what would the best acid be? Well, it's either going to be water or it's going to be acetic, or, uh, sorry, hydrocyanic acid. So it's going to be the HCN. Let's go to the next slide. So you can see all these things they've listed here. Uh, every possible thing that could bump into something else and react with it is listed here. So you'll notice here they've even listed Na plus H2O and they've listed Na plus OH, which even though we just said that if you put NaOH in water, it's going to go back <coughs> and break up completely into Na plus and OH minus. So really, these last two things here are not equilibrium. They're going to go all the way to the left. The Na plus and the H2O here are not going to react. So we actually have three legitimate possibilities. One of them is the auto dissociation of water, number one at the top there. But that's only going to happen if it's the only thing available. And for our purposes, there will never be a problem, at least not that, that I can remember where that will happen. So we also have these other two possibilities, HCN plus H2O. Well, we said a moment ago that that is possible, uh, but the Ka value won't be very high for that one. So how, assuming that it's not going to be H2O plus H2O, how do we choose which of these two is going to be the one that's going to be the dominant reaction? And notice that's what they're calling it here. And it's going to be the one that has the highest K value. 
Uh, so I won't go through a long detailed explanation of how you find the Ka value. This is a Ka expression, so you can just look it up. For this one, you have to do it a little bit differently. You have to find it, though. You have to find the K value for 3, uh, or at least at the initial stages of your learning this. <clears throat> okay, so what's, what's going to happen? Well, they're going to say, okay, let's just forget about 4 and 5 because they're not really equilibrium. And let's forget about number 1 because it's got such a tiny constant. It's like 10 to the minus 14, so forget that one. So we've got two things left here out of all these possibilities we just lifted, listed. And so that's why I really don't want you to go through this on the test, because unless you just want to, because it takes too long. So can you just look at these two things right here? Just look at number two here that I'm underlining, and then look at number three. Which one of those do you think is going to go more to the right? If you add water to a weak acid or if you add a strong base to a weak acid? And the answer is going to be this one right here is the one that's got the best acid and the best base. So look, you, you can go through all of this mixing and matching if you want to, but I'm not going to do it anymore after this particular example. So when we get to these slides where they list all this stuff, I'm just going to go on. Uh, but So what you have to learn to do is to recognize which one of these gives you your best acid and your best base. So you tell me which one it's going to be. Let's go on to the next slide. Uh, so here they're just, let's, you can pause this and read this. I'm going to go to the next slide. Uh, and here they are getting to the point where they're listing the K values. And again, this one's going to be not the one you choose ever. As far as I remember, this one will never be the one you choose. They're just trying to make sure you remember it's there. Uh, for the HCN, the K values 10 to the minus 10th here. And then for the HCN, it's Ka over Kw, which I showed you how to figure this out just in case you were wondering. <clears throat> but you probably won't have to do that on a test. Let's just go to the next slide. Uh, and it turns out that that one that I just underlined on that previous slide, the K is huge. I mean, it's, it's, it's actually a positive value, right? Whereas the other ones were negative. So, I mean, this one is much, 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 much greater than the other two. So again, <clears throat> just try to get to the point where you can recognize these. Just, I mean, it should be clear to everyone, I think, at this point that if you have a choice between water uh, reacting with, let's say, HCN versus OH minus reacting with HCN, which one's going to be the most reactive? It should be clear to everyone it's going to be HCN plus OH minus because you're reacting a weak acid with a strong base. But that's still good. It's good because at least it lets you see what's going on. And it's uh, showing you how you would do this, I mean, if you wanted to do it like from scratch. Let's go to the next thing. Uh, and then here I'm, I'm doing is just showing you the way that I figured out the K value for that last reaction. Remember that last reaction wasn't really a Ka reaction because we weren't adding H2O. What were we adding? we were adding HCN plus OH minus. So that's not a K expression, it's just a K expression. And so what I'm telling you here, and I think also on the next slide, I'm just, show, I'm just showing you how to figure out what the K value would be. Next slide. Okay, so this is what we would have come up with in our process. Best acid right there that I just put a line above. Best base right there. <clears throat> If you react those together, what's going to happen? Well, the OH minus will pluck a proton off the HCN, and that will make water. Again, acid plus base gives water plus salt. And you're left here with the conjugate base of your HCN, which is CN minus. All right, so uh, let's see. In this particular case, I can't remember the quantities. So let's move to the next slide and look at this. Um, all right, so notice here that they are not listing OH minus. So why aren't they listing OH minus? And uh, also they are listing CN minus, but they're not listing HCN. Oh, yes, they are. Okay, so uh, we now have enough of the CN minus that we can consider that to be a major species. The reason they're not listing OH minus is because it's all been eaten up by the HCN. Uh, let's keep going. Next slide. So the OH minus has been eaten up. Uh, but in the process of that happening, we were producing enough CN minus that we can now consider that to be a major species. 
So we now have this, which is important because it has acid-base properties, right? And this also has acid-base properties, and so does this. But what about Na+, plus? What, what did we say earlier about Na+, plus? It, it doesn't have any acid-base properties, so just forget about that. So uh, now that we've done this, what, I mean, I don't think they do it here, they might, but uh, <clears throat> what would we do if we wanted to write an equilibrium that involved these three things right here, this and this and this? Well, it's easy. It's just HCN plus H2O gives CN minus plus H3O plus, right? So that's the kind of a thing you could write across the top of what kind of a table. And I'll let you think about that while we go to the next slide. Uh, and we're finished with this one. Let's go to another one now. So again, they're not finishing these off completely uh, because they're just introducing the topic of titrations. Another example, calculate the pH of a solution made by mixing 0.2 moles of CH3COOH with 0.03 moles. So this number is less than this number. We have more of the acid than we do with the base. So what's going to happen? Well, I mean, just to kind of cut to the chase here, and they're going to go through the same process, but we really just need to figure out what's going to happen by finding the best acid and the best base. Now, we have water in here, too, but clearly the best acid will be CH3COOH, right? Not water. And the best base will be uh, NaOH, not water. So what we would do in this kind of a problem is we would immediately recognize that. Uh, so just uh, react your best acid, which is CH3COOH, with your best base, which is NaOH, until one of them disappears, or in rare cases, until both of them disappear. But that doesn't happen here. Okay, so then what you're going to do is figure out how many moles you'll have left over of NaOH, and how many moles you'll have left over of CH3COOH, and that's called the stoichiometric calculation. Once you do that, then you divide the number of moles that are left over by the new total volume, and that will give you the molarity of whatever you're interested in, which in this case will be the CH3COOH. And can you think of what else is going to be produced when, what happens when this right here reacts with this, specifically with the OH minus? Are we producing something else? And the answer is yes. What is it? So I'll let you think about that. Uh, we'll need to also find the number of moles of that that are going to be produced. And then for both of those things, whatever is being produced, and also for the acetic acid, we have to find the concentration and migrate the concentrations over to the top row of our ice table. So to do that, we have to not only get the number of moles, but then we have to divide the number of moles that we discovered by the total volume. Okay. So here, in this case, it's easy because they tell you, hey, it's just one liter, so you don't have to really do anything. But most of the time, you will. Next slide. So again, I'm going to let you pause here. I'm going to go ahead and keep going. Uh, and just I'm going to keep clicking these until I get off of this slide. <clears throat> so because we've talked about it before. Next. And then I'm going to keep going next. Uh, and next. And next. So the only good thing about this is we're getting through some of this. Uh, all right. So we're back to what I said all the way back about three slides ago. We're just taking the best acid and reacting with the best base and seeing which one runs out first. And to do that, you have to know how many moles you have of each one, obviously. And it's just you just subtract. It's just one to one here. So uh, we had 0.2 moles of the acid and we had 0.03 moles of the base. So subtract away until one of them vanishes. Uh, in this case, this is going to vanish first because there's less of it. <clears throat> so subtract how much of this you have from both sides. So 0.03 minus 0.03 is 0. So this is out of play now. It's off the table. 0.03 taken away from 0.2 leaves 0.17. And in the process of this reacting with this, we produce 0.03 moles of the acetate. So now what do we have left over? Well, the acetate that we just produced and the acid that's left over after it reacted with the OH minus and ate it all up. Now for each one of these two values here and here, we now have to divide that by the total volume and then move those values 
of molarity over to the top row of our ice table, which I don't think they're going to do that here, but we'll see. Next. Next. Uh, pause it here if you want. Next. And okay, yeah, so they are doing that. So this is going to be 0.17 because when we divided 0.17 moles by one liter, we got 0.17. Same thing for the 0.03 over here. Uh, if the water, again, we don't care about it. And then for the H3O+, plus, which is really the thing that we care about maybe most, uh, we assume we're starting at zero, right? So this is what I was going to say a moment ago, actually several slides back, is we're going to end up with acetic acid and acetate over here. And then, of course, you always have water. And so I asked the question a while back, what kind of an equilibrium could you write that would include those? And here it is. So just the Ka expression for CH3COH. Now, a lot of this won't come until you get some practice on this. It's going to take a while to get used to this. But notice here, all three of these things were things that were left over as major species uh, before when we talked about this. And they're all right. It's just like, I mean, wow, look at that. They all are in this equilibrium. So clearly, this is the equilibrium we want. So write this across the top of the table. And again, you can also, if you want, write it in the reverse direction. And you can put CH3COO over here and then put this one over here. And you'll get this. And of course, this is going to become OH minus here. But you'll get the same answer as long as you remember to change Ka to Kb. However, for your purposes for right now, I would stick with the way it's written here. Uh, so that's just for the intellectually minded people that tend to ask these kinds of questions. And that's good that you do. Uh, anyway, th so that's the answer to the question that you may have asked yourself if you did ask yourself that question. So anyway, so these values in this top row are coming from the previous slide or whatever. And then, of course, we just have our usual here on the change row, which is minus x. And then on the right hand side of the double headed arrow, you have plus x and plus x. And since all of these numbers here in front of these different things are one, then you don't have to change the numbers. It's just minus x, plus x, and plus x. So 0 plus x is x. 0 0.03 plus x is 0 0.03 plus x, but we're going to neglect that. So it's just going to be 0 0.03. 0 0.17 minus x is just going to be 0 0.17. And our Ka is going to equal products of a reactants which means it's going to equal 0.03 times x over 0.17. And that will equal Ka, which in this case is 1.8e minus 5. Next slide. And so here are the calcs, which is just exactly what I just said here, um, except we're, we're going to get rid of that, right? We're going to get rid of that. So we're going to wind up with 0.03 divided by 0.17. Uh, and then that's multiplied times x, and that equals the Ka here. Solve for x, and you get or should get 1.02 <clears throat> times 10 to the minus fourth. I recommend very strongly that you do this on your own. Make sure you get the right answer. Look back, which I can't do, but look back at the chart, if you can do it, and see what does the x stand for. And you'll see that it actually stands for two different things. But what we really care about here is the one that it stands for, for the H3O+. And the reason is because we want to find the pH. So the, let me just say this. Usually what we're trying to do in these problems is we're trying to find the pH. So what we'll usually care about is the H3O plus concentration or the OH minus concentration. So we find that X is 1.02 times 10 to the minus 4. So take minus the log of that. And that will give you your pH. Let's go to the next slide. Just a little over an hour here. And we haven't actually even started the titrations, but hopefully those won't be too bad. OK, so here's a picture of what we just did. And this is actually what I sketched at the very beginning of this. So you notice here, this is a weak acid. So the pH initially won't be that low here. It's about three when we start off, as opposed to maybe down here if it were a strong acid. So that means the equivalence point is going to be shifted up above seven. So seven is right here. So notice that it's been shifted up a little bit because we didn't start low down like we would have if it had been a strong acid. Do you see that? So typically for a weak acid strong base titration, 
your equivalence point will be above 7, but we won't be able to guess what it will be. We'll have to actually just figure that out. <clears throat> All right, so before we, and then once you get past the equivalence point, now that means you've used up all your acid. So now all you have left from this point on over here is just OH minus. So it's pretty easy to find the pH of that. You just find how, so just subtract the number of moles you added of the OH minus minus the number of moles you started with your acid. And so in this case, what I just, where I just drew that, that regime, you're only going to have OH minus, so you just need to find out how much of the OH minus you have and divide it by the total volume. Uh, and that will give you the concentration of OH minus. And if you take minus the log of that, you'll have the pOH. Just subtract that from 14. Okay, so let me just make a, a notation here. In this particular kind of a titration, if you're between what I'm circling right now, which is the very beginning point. In other words, before you added any base at all. If you're between that point and the point I'm circling now, which is the equivalence point, if you're in this regime, that is your buffering zone. <clears throat> you can use the HH equation there. In other words, find the concentration of the base, find the concentration of the acid, divide them, Take the log of that and then add that to pKa for your acid and you'll have the pH. You don't have to do it that way. You can also do it in the method that we saw just recently where you just do your stoichiometric calculations as we did them before. So I won't say any more about that. So the idea is here, <clears throat> just keep in mind that you can use the HH equation, but for right now, they want you to actually practice doing these kinds of problems by doing it the way they just showed you. And what I mean by that is use your stoichiometric calcs, find the concentrations of the acid and base that are left over, and then do your, equi your equilibrium calcs. So let me just say that again, because this is super important. Everything between right there and right here, everything between those two, not inclusive, of those two points, just everything between them is the buffering region of this titration. And so let me also say what I said just a moment ago again. If you are taking a test and you know you're in that region, you can use the HH equation to find the pH. And again, that's usually the bottom line. It's to find the pH. Okay, so anyway, that's enough said about this. So let's move on. All right, so sample titration sets, let's go on next. All right, so first of all, we're gonna do strong acid, strong base, and there's a couple of shortcuts here. Basically, what we're gonna do for this is we're gonna remember, first of all, do you remember a rule that we talked about earlier? What is the pH at the equivalence point if it's a strong acid, strong base titration? And only if. <clears throat> and you may remember that we said the pH will always be seven. Uh, so if you're before that, you're going to have more acid than base. So subtract how many moles of base you have, or you've added, from how many moles of acid you started with. And that will wind up being a little bit of acid or a lot of acid left over and no base. Uh, and then <clears throat> take the number of moles of acid that are left over and divide by the total volume. To get the total volume, you'll have to use the volume you started with of your acid, plus you'll have to add the volume you added of the strong base to get your total. So divide by that number, and it has to be in liters, so if it's 70 milliliters, you have to convert it, so that would become 0.07 liters. That will give you the molarity of your acid that still remains. And then you want minus the base 10 log of that, and that will give you the pH. Now, if you're at the equivalence point, then it's just pH is 7. So that's the nice thing about these kinds of titration. And then if you're past the equivalence point, you do the same thing we just said, only this time you're going to have more base than acid. So you're going to wind up subtracting how many moles of acid you have from how many moles of base you have. And so you'll wind up with a certain number of OH minus moles. 
Then again, add the two volumes together, the volume that you started with of the acid plus the volume of base that you added. That will give you your total volume. Usually it'll be in milliliters. So like again, if it's 150 milliliters, that's 0.15 liters. So however many moles you have of the OH minus, <clears throat> divide that by 0.15 liters to get the concentration of the OH minus. And then you have to be careful here. Uh, take minus the log of that, but that will give you the pOH, right? Not the pH. So how do you go from pOH to, to pH? Just subtract from 14, and that will give you the pH. So for each of these three main sets of titrations, we're going to do strong acid, strong base, which is the one we're doing right now. Weak acid, strong base, which is the one that we'll start at next. Hopefully in just a few minutes, because we're not I'm not planning on spending a ton of time on this, because there's not that much to talk about. And then the weak base, strong acid, which we do in part two. Uh, all right, so for each of those, for each of those, we're going to do a set of four steps, and they are as follows. At the very beginning, uh, part way to the equivalence point, which, in other words, between the start point and the equivalence point, and then third would be at the equivalence point, and fourth would be after the equivalence point. Okay, so we're going to do that for this titration, and then we'll do it next, before we finish this, we'll do it for weak acid, strong base. So let me just go through these, I mean, like before we even flip to the next slide. If you only have the strong acid, so I'm going to go through the four steps for strong acid, strong base, and then we'll go through them slide by slide, okay? But I'm just going to tell you what's going to happen. If you just have the strong acid, all you have to do is take the concentration, take minus the log of that, and you're done. It's just like the easy problems we were doing before in chapter 14. We're just, when you say uh, you have 0.1 molar HCl, well, the concentration of the H plus, we're going to assume is going to be the same as the concentration of the acid because it's strong acid. So just assume it's 0.1 molar HCl, then it's 0.1 molar H plus minus the log of 0.1. In other words, minus the log of 10 to the minus 1 is going to be 1. So the pH is just going to be 1, and you're done. So that part's easy. Uh, if you're less than, if you're between the starting point and the equivalence point, then you just do what I said a moment ago. But I'll say it again, because maybe that'll help, uh, because repetition is the best teacher. Subtract the number of moles of base from the number of moles of acid. Divide by the total volume to get the concentration of the acid, and then take minus the log of the concentration of the acid to get the pH. And boom, that's it. So I'm going to put a check mark here. Three, if you are at the equivalence point, which is what they mean by this, they're saying if you've added the equivalent amount of base, they mean the number of moles. You're at the equivalence point. That means the pH is what? I'll let you think about that on your own. And then after you've added extra base, so that now you've eaten up all the acid, then we talked about this also, you just subtract the number of moles of acid from the number of moles of base. And that will give you the number of moles of base that are left over, or excess. And then divide it again by the total volume to get it into a concentration. And then take minus the log of that. And But be careful because that's going to give you pOH, not pH. Next slide. All right, so, and then here's a graph of what this would look like, so it's pretty straightforward here. Notice here that your uh, equivalence point is always going to be at pH equals 7. Anytime you have any of the acids we decided we're going to use for strong acids, and the titration is with one of the seven bases that we decided we're going to consider to be strong bases, then just write it down. And, and it, it never fails that, I mean, I give this on exams. I'll just say, if you're titrating hydrochloric acid, and I'll put a number in there, and you're titrating it with NaOH, what's the pH at the equivalence point? And you can answer that, right? Hopefully, it's 7. And it never fails that, I mean, you can guess what I'm getting ready to say, right? That people start trying to figure it out using calculations. All they have to do is just write down pH, pH is 7. Okay, next slide. Okay, so for this particular example, we're going to work through our four steps, and they want us to do this for 0.05 liters, right? 
just moving the decimal place back through places. Uh, point two moles per liter of HNO3. What kind of an acid is nitric acid? It's a strong acid, right? <clears throat> okay, so when we first start off, what we need to know is the concentration. So for the very first step here, before we add any NaOH, all we care about is what? We care about the concentration of the acid. And we're going to assume the concentration of H plus will be the same because we're going to assume that this HNO3 will completely dissociate. So if the concentration of H plus is 0.2 molar, to find the pH, you just take minus the log of that. So let's move on, if I can. Uh, and notice here how they're going through all these steps, and that's fine if you have unlimited time, but you're not going to have unlimited time on the exams. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, so notice all they did at the end of the day is they just took minus the log of the concentration of the acid, which is 0.699, or if you wanted to round it off, it would be 0.7. Okay, so that's it. So for the four steps that we have to do for strong acid, strong base, boom, there's one of them out of the way right away. Let's move on to the next one. Okay, now we've added some of the base. We've added 0.01 liters. And I recommend that you learn how to do this in your head quickly uh, because it'll, it'll make it a lot easier. 0.01 liters times 0.1 moles per liter gives you 0.01 moles. Which if you'll think back, <clears throat> When we started off with our acid, we had 0.05 times 0.2, which is going to be 0 0.1 moles of the acid. So 0 0.1 moles of acid, we add 0 0.01 moles of the base. What we need, and, and again, they're going through all of this stuff here, which you can look over if you want to, uh, but we aren't, we're not going to do that. We're just going to go ahead and cut to the chase. And we're going to figure out how many moles of the acid are still hanging around. To do that, we need to do the stoichiometric calculations. So let's go to the next slide. And uh, if I can get it changed. So we're starting off with 0.01 moles of the H plus and only 0.001 moles of the OH minus here. <clears throat> So how did they get that? Well, 0.1 molar for the NaOH times 0 0.01 liters or 10 milliliters uh, is 0 0.001 moles of the OH minus. And I think I said that wrong, so I apologize for that. And over here, 0.2 times 0.05, and I may have said this one wrong too, it's supposed to be 0.01. Which somehow, for some reason that, okay, anyway, I guess that's right. Anyway, let's not waste time on it. Okay, so which one of these is going to run out first? We've got 0.01 moles of the H plus. We've got 0.001 moles of the OH minus. So clearly we have more of the acid. <clears throat> so subtract 0.001 moles from both of these, from this one and from this one. And for this one, it's just going to be zero, right? We're going to wipe it out. So we end up with 0. And then for this one, we wind up with 0 0.01 minus 0 0.001, which leaves us with 0 0.009 moles of this. Okay, so this is what we needed to know, but we can't take minus the log of the number of moles to get the pH, which is what we're trying to do. We need the what? What do we need? Not the number of moles, but what? The, the concentration of the H plus or H3O plus, right? So to get that, we have to divide the number of moles, which is 0 0.009, by the total volume. So let's do this together. What's the total volume? Well, we added 0 0.05 liters of H plus originally, and to that, we titrated in 0 0.01 liters of the base. So we want to add these two numbers together, and when we do that, we get 0. 0 0.05 plus 0 0.01. This is really hard to write with. I wish I could get to the point where I could actually write with this thing. Uh, anyway, it's 0 0.06 liters, and it's also written down here where you can see it better. So 
uh, what I just wrote right here is reproduced down here on this line. <clears throat> anyway, so that's how you do it. Divide the number of moles by the new total volume, which is 0 0.06 liters. So when you do that, when you divide the 0 0.009 moles by the 0 0.06 liters, you get 0.15 molar. Now we have what we need to find the pH. So remember that when you're finding the pH, you need the concentration of the H plus or H3O plus. Anyway, so we now want to take minus the log of that number right there. And we do that and we get that the pH is 0.824, which is less than one. So that's really acidic. Okay, so that's how you would do any problem in that regime for this titration between the start point and the equivalence point. Now, the question might arise, can you just use the HH equation? So what we have to do is think about what the HH equation is used for. It's used for buffer solutions, right? And what is a buffer solution? It's a weak acid and it's in solution with its conjugate base. But we don't have a weak acid here. We have a strong acid. So if you try to use the HH equation, you're not going to have a conjugate base. So what's the concentration going to be of your conjugate base? Well, there isn't one. I mean, there is one. Like for HCl, for example, the conjugate base is Cl minus. But I mean, it won't work. I guess what I'm, I should do is just tell you you can't do it. OK, that's probably the easiest thing. So when can you do it? Well, mainly when you're doing weak acid, strong base titrations. Or if you're given a buffer problem, what do I mean by a buffer problem? Well, a problem where they give you like, OK, you started with 0.5 molar uh, acetic acid and you dumped in 0.5 molar acetate. So don't be careful. Don't make the mistake here. And people have done this where they'll try to use the HH equation on this problem. So you tell me, why can't you use the HH equation here? What's wrong? What, what, what's the problem? The problem is that for the HH equation, you have to have a weak acid strong base, or it could also be a weak base strong acid, not a strong acid strong base. Okay, so I probably spent too much time on Let's move on. Next slide. All right, now we're at the equivalence point. Now let's just, before we even start this, if you're at the equivalence point of a strong acid strong base titration, your answer is pH is seven. And that's all you have to write down. Now, even if you get a work problem, short answer on your test, and they tell you, we want you to figure out what the pH is. Well, maybe if they ask it in that way, you, if it's a if it's a short answer question and it's worth eight points, you know, you, you probably, <laughs> it's kind of a mixed bag there because you don't really have to do the calculation and it's not wrong, only in this particular case though, but. If it's a multiple choice question, let's say, let's make it easier and just say it's a multiple choice question. Don't do any calculations. The answer is seven. OK. Uh, all right. So let's just forget about what I said before and just move on. So we only have one more step here uh, and I'm just going to go ahead and skip it. So if you want to pause here and read this, you can. I'm going to move on. Uh, and this is the fourth point, the fourth data point for strong acid, strong base, and we'll be done with it. If you're past the equivalence point, you do it the same way we did the other one before the equivalence point, except it's reversed. So you want to subtract how many moles you have of the acid this time from the number of moles of base. Uh, it's not quite that easy because you actually have to figure out those numbers of moles. So for both the acid and the base, you have to figure it out by multiplying the moles per liter or the molarity times the volume. In other words, you're multiplying moles per liter times liters and you're getting moles. So for example, here for the H plus, uh, which is what we, this is the same as it was when we started. It's, it hasn't changed. So it's still 0.2 moles per liter times 0.05 liters and that's still 0.01 moles. But for the base now, this has changed because now they're saying we've now added 150 milliliters or 0.15 liters. So now and the concentration hasn't changed, but how much we've added here has changed. So now we're multiplying 0.1 times 0.15, and we're getting 0.015 moles of the base. And then comparing that with the number of moles of the acid, we see that we have more of the base. So when we add the best acid and best base together to get rid of one of them, this time it's going to be the acid that runs out first. 
So it's gone. It's eaten all up, and we're left with 0.015 minus 0.01 moles of the base, which is 0.005 moles of the base is left over. But remember, we can't use that to get the pH, which is what we're after, right? What do we have to divide that 0.005 by to get to the pH? Next slide. Um, we have to divide it, and that's unfortunate that I changed slides, but uh, if I hadn't switched to this slide, I would show you how to find the total volume. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you may want to go back uh, and just see if you can figure out what the total volume was. When you add the volume of the acid to the volume of the base, I think it was 0.5, uh, no, sorry, 0 0.05 liters maybe of the acid and 0.15 liters of the base. Uh, anyway, you might want to just double check to make sure you know how to do that. But your total volume, when you add the volume of the acid to the volume of the base, you should get 0.2 liters. And then, so you would then divide the number of moles of the base that you had left over, which is 0 0.005, by the new total volume, which is 0.2. And you should get, when you do that division, 0 0.025 molar. Now, because this is a concentration, when we take minus the log of that concentration, in this case it's concentration of OH minus, that will give us the pOH, not the pH. So again, you have to be careful. So the pOH is 1.6. To get the pH, we subtract the 1.6 from 14, and then we get like 12.4, right? So that will give us the pH, and they almost always want that for the answer. So the pH here, uh, is 12.4, and then this last zero gets put in because of sig figs. All right, so that is it for this titration. We're at almost an hour and a half. <clears throat> so that's the first major titration. I think you'll understand by now that it isn't really that big of a deal. Uh, so, uh, and then the third major titration is going to be done in part two, so we only have one left. So let's go ahead and knock that out, and then we'll call it a day. Next slide. Uh, so here's a summary of what we just did if you want to look at this. Uh, so each one of the points here, we've got one, two, three, four main points. And here is a, just a very brief discussion of how you do each of those four points. Uh, so let's move on now to the weak acid strong base. <clears throat> next slide. Um, next slide. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and, and we've already seen this graph. Uh, notice the, the thing you want to notice here is we start a little bit above where we ordinarily would. This is actually the same graph I showed you before. The, the equivalence point will be above 7, and then this the whole curve basically is shifted up, right, as opposed to when you're doing a, a strong a, sorry strong acid. <clears throat> it's all shifted up because you're not starting as low. So the equivalence point will be more than 7. Next. All right, so when we have a weak acid, we do the pH for it before we add any of the OH minus, the same way we did these before. We just make an ice table. So you'll be told what is your concentration of acetic acid. In this case, it's 0.1. So you just want to set up an ice table, just as we've done in the past. Excuse me. Let's go to the next slide. Um, and then let's go to the next slide. Go. It's being very stubborn. Okay, so just do these the same way we've done these in the past. You start off with your equilibrium across the top. Uh, we know the initial concentration of the acid here is 0.1 molar, and we assume for this one and this one that there's starting off at zero. Uh, so uh, minus x here, plus x on these two, and you wind up with Ka, which in this case, because this is acetic acid, what's Ka for acetic acid? It's 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth, right? Equals the equilibrium concentrations of the products over the reactants equilibrium concentrations raised to the power of their coefficients. In other words, here it will be 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth equals x squared over 0.1. And we forget about that. Okay, so that's all you have to do. And we've done it before, so you already know how to do it. So that's one step out of the way. Let's go to the next slide. So we wind up with uh, 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5th equals x squared over 0.1 when we get rid of that minus x there. 
So just obliterate that, and we get x is 1.34 times 10 to the minus third. And then take minus the log of that, and you've got your answer. And since we've done this before so many times, let's move on. So now we want to go to a point that's between the start point and the equivalence point. So let's do that next. All right, so here we are. Now, what they did here is they pulled a kind of a sneaky one on us. And they made it so that it's exactly halfway between the start point and the equivalence point. But that doesn't really help you if you get a problem where it isn't exactly halfway. So what we're going to do is we'll do it this way first. So now what we need to know is, first of all, how many moles did we add of the NaOH? Well, we added 0.1 moles per liter times 0.05 liters, whatever that is. I think it's 0.005. But uh, don't trust me on that. I think it's 0 0.005 moles of NaOH. How many moles, and I can't back up, so I can't remember how many moles we started with. Let's see. Oh, I guess maybe it gives us here. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, so 0 0.1 liters of the acid times 0 0.1. Uh, yeah, that's right. So 0 0.1 times 0 0.1 is 0 0.01. So we started with 0 0.01 moles of the acid. And we've added half of that of the base. So in other words, we've added 0.005 moles of the base. So what that means is that we're halfway to the equivalence point. And this has a special significance. So let me take a little bit longer with this one. What we wind up with here is this. So this is a shortcut. When you're exactly halfway to the equivalence point, you can write pH equals pKa. Now this should ring a bell to you because we said the same thing as what I'm writing right now before when we were talking about buffers. And do you remember that? We said that if the concentration of the weak acid and the concentration of its conjugate base are exactly the same, pH equals pKa. But that was when we were talking about buffers. But the same thing applies here. And the reason is because we're in the buffer zone. And we can use this as a buffer because this is a weak acid. Now, just a few minutes ago, I said that if you're doing a strong acid titration with a strong base, you can't use the HH equation because it's not a weak acid. But here now we're dealing with a weak acid. So we can use the HH equation. So let's just do that for a second. The HH equation says the pH of your solution, which is what we're always interested in, equals pKa, which was 4.75, plus the log of the concentration of the base over the concentration of the acid. Right? <clears throat> so uh, what is going to happen here is if we have added half as much base and this is not the conjugate base. This is the strong base. I mean, I'm kind of like doing this in my head, but you probably won't follow it until we actually go to the next slides. But if we've added 0.05 moles, let's see, or 0.005 moles of the base, then it will react with the same number of moles of the acid to produce the conjugate base of the weak acid. And the number of moles of that that you're going to produce are going to be the same as the number of moles that you started with of your weak acid. So the HH equation says that pH equals pKa plus, I mean, don't worry about it if you can't see this in your head, because we're going to get to it. But And I'll try to remember to point it out when we get to it. Plus the log of the concentration of the base over the concentration of the acid. So just let me just say this to cut to the chase which in this particular case, when we're halfway to the equivalence point, means the concentration of the conjugate base and the concentration of the weak acid are going to be the same. Now, don't confuse. When I'm saying conjugate base, I'm not talking about this base. I'm talking about CH3COO minus, OK? Its concentration will be the same as the concentration at that point of the CH3COOH. So in other words, we're going to have whatever the concentration is, 0 0.005, let's say. It'll be the same for both of them. So when you take the ratio, or in other words, when you divide 0 0.005 by itself, you get 1. And the log of 1 is 0. In this equation right here, that last part drops out. 
because the log of 1 is 0. So you just wind up, instead of it being pH equals pK plus the log of the base over the acid, that whole last part vanishes. So you wind up just with pH equals pKa, which is what we have here. So we had already talked about this before when we talked about buffers. Now we're saying that when we're doing a titration, if we're doing a weak acid strong base, or later we'll see that we can say the same thing about a weak uh, base strong acid. If we're exactly halfway to the equivalence point, we can use a shortcut. And the shortcut is that whatever the pKa for that weak acid is, it's going to be what the pH is, which for this one, uh, since we're doing acetic acid, right, <clears throat> we already know what the pKa for that is, right? If Ka is 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth, then pKa is going to be about 4.75, which means the pH will also be 4.75. So we don't have to do anything. So this is kind of like when you're at the equivalence point for strong acid, strong base, right? We just write down 7. So here we can just write down that the pH is going to be 4.75 and we're done. So, I mean, if this were a short answer question, you'd probably want to show your calcs. But even on a short answer question, I'd probably accept it if you just tell me that you know that when we're halfway to the equivalence point that it's pH equals pKa. But there's another possibility here, and that would be that if we're between the start point and the equivalence point, but we're not exactly halfway to the equivalence point. So if you're in that kind of a situation, which you very well could be on a test, <clears throat> then the way that you do that is you subtract the number of moles of base from the number of moles of acid, and then you figure out how many moles of acid would be left over and divide by the total volume as we were doing previously in the last titration. And then that will give you your concentration of H plus or acid that's left over. Not H plus, that's wrong. It's the concentration of acid that's left over. In this case, it would be the concentration of CH3COOH. And then once you have that, you would migrate that into an ice table in the top row and set up your equilibrium as always. CH3COOH plus H2O gives CH3COO minus plus H3O plus. <clears throat> Start off with an initial concentration of the CH3COO minus and H3O plus as being about zero, and then go from there. And that's the way that, that technically they want you to be doing this right now. However, on a test, you can also recognize that you're in a buffer zone. You're, you're dealing with a buffer here which means you can use the HH equation, as we said a long time ago, like an hour and 37 minutes ago, <clears throat> which means you can say pH equals pKa plus the log of the concentration of the base, which in this case, they're talking about the base of CH3COOH, which is CH3COO minus. They're not talking about the NaOH here. So if you can figure out the concentration of the acetate and the concentration of the acetic acid, and you should be able to do that without too much trouble, then you can divide the concentration of the base by the concentration of the acid, get the ratio, take the log of that, and then add that to pKa, which you already know, in this case, it's 4.75. You can just add those two things together and that will give you the pH. So. Which way is better? Well, neither way is really better. It's just whichever one you understand better. or I mean, I don't think really either one of them is even particularly faster than the other one. So uh, the answer is you can use either one, and, and I have absolutely no preference. So in this case, what happened was that when we added uh, plus the log of the concentration of the base over the acid, that wound up being zero for this particular example because we were exactly halfway to the equivalence point. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide and look at this in more detail. Uh, let's go to the next slide here. Next. Next. Uh, so here's what I was talking about before. I'll just stop here on this slide for a moment and point this out. So since we started off with 0.01 moles of the acid and we've reacted exactly half of those, we have 0.005 moles left, which is what we said. And in the process of 
uh, eating up the 0.005 moles of the base here, we actually ended up producing 0.005 moles of the conjugate base, right? So that's what I've been saying here, is if we take this concentration, well, we would actually have to divide these. These are numbers of moles, right? So let's, let's do this together. What's our total volume here? Uh, we have 50 milliliters here that we added of the base, and we started with 100 milliliters of the acid. So tell me, how many milliliters would we have total? If we add this and this, what are we going to have? <clears throat> 150 uh, milliliters, right? Or 0.15 liters. So uh, what we could do is we could divide both of these values right here, this one and this one, by 0.15 liters and get concentrations. But they're, I mean, obviously they're going to be the same. But that's what you would have to do to do this, like, you know, ex to be exactly right. Uh, and then you would have, so you'd have 0.15 liters here and then the same thing here. Uh, so, but when you do that, you're going to have the same number for both of these, for this one and for this one over here. You're going to have the same number. So when you divide the concentration of the base by the concentration of the acid, you're dividing the same number by the same number. And when you divide the same number by itself, you get 1. And when you take the log of 1, you get 0. Okay, so hopefully this, I mean, if this doesn't make sense to you, it will. If this isn't really that bad. The, a lot of this stuff is just getting used to this new nomenclature. Getting used to using ice tables and then getting used to using these new tables that we just started this chapter called stoichiometric tables. Okay, anyway, let's go ahead and knock this out and finish this. Next slide. Uh, look at this if you want to. I'm going to go to the next slide. Uh, okay, so here's what they actually got when they did the division of the number of moles here of the acid and then here of the base. And notice the numbers are the same for both of them, right? So both of these are the same. Uh, when you divide them by this total volume here for both of them, you get the same number for both. So for the weak acid here and also its conjugate base here, you get the same value both for the number of moles and for the concentrations. The concentrations, the numbers are 0.033 molar for both of them. So to use the HH equation, you would divide 0.033 by itself and get 1 and take the log of 1, which is 0. So that whole term would vanish and you get pH equals pKa, right? Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Um, if you do it this way, and that's perfectly fine, you wind up with 0 0.033. And this number, remember, we just saw where that came from, right? It came from that previous slide. Uh, and then that's we're just going to mark out that minus x there, and we're going to mark out the plus x here, and we're going to get the same thing. Uh, so Ka is going to equal 0.033x over 0.033 which is just, would that would reduce to x equals uh, Ka, which is 4.75. Wait, let me, hold on for one second. Let me make sure I said that right. Okay, so let's, that's right. So let's go to the slide. So x is going to be Ka, which is one, uh, maybe I said 4.7. I'm sorry. If I said, I can't remember if I said 4.75 because I was thinking ahead. Uh, or if I said 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth, I think I might have said 4.75. But anyway, x is going to equal Ka, which is going to be 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth. Uh, and if you look at the chart, you'll see that x, if you read up the chart, it stands for uh, the concentration of H3O plus, right? So if we take minus the log of this 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth, we get the pH, which is 4.75, which... I think I mistakenly said that instead of 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth. All right. So anyway, uh, so the thing is, is like you can use the table on the previous slide for any point between the start point and the equivalence point. Whereas you can only use this little shortcut formula if it's exactly halfway between the start point and the equivalence point. So just be careful with this. And also, one other thing that I need to say here before we move on, and I think we're basically done here, uh, is that they're not going to tell you usually, anyway, like almost never are they going to tell you, hey, you're halfway to the equivalence point. What you'll have to do is you'll have to realize that as you do the problem. So like if you find out, like let's say you figure out you've got 0.03 moles of added base and you start at 0.06 moles of the acid, 
your little light bulb has to come on in your brain and you have to say, ah, I'm halfway to the equivalence point. Okay, and then once you realize that, then if you want, you can use your shortcut here, which is just pH equals pKa. So as long as you know what Ka is for that particular acid, and usually it's given to you, uh, then you can just uh, cut to the chase and do pH equals pKa. Now, if you don't understand this even now, uh, and you go through it a couple of times and you still don't understand it, then just email me. But I promise you that once you get the idea here of what's going on, it's not that bad. At least I hope. Um, uh, hopefully it's not that bad. Next slide. So uh, read this if you want to pause here uh, and read it. Go ahead. Next slide. And then just, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we're at one hour and 45 minutes and we're basically finished. Uh, this is just the very last data point for the weak acid strong base titration. So this is after the equivalence point and you do this exactly the same way you did it when you were doing the same data point for the strong acid strong base. Uh, so let's just go ahead and move on to the next slide. Uh, next. All right, next slide, next slide, next slide, next slide. Okay, so notice here we have now used up all the acid. So this is all gone. So let's just draw a line through it. And we've also uh, got zero moles of the OH minus left over. Uh, uh, let's see, uh, we're at, okay, we're at the equivalence point. I, I actually kind of skipped a slide mentally skipped a step so we're actually at the equivalence point here so i'm my bad we're at the equivalence point here so i was thinking we were after the equivalence point so we'll have to talk about this for a few minutes so when we're at the equivalence point what it means is that we've added the same number of moles of base as we started with a number of moles of acid so when we do our subtracting away to see which one runs out first they both run out so this one is actually the hardest one that we're going to talk about this whole video because what you have to do is realize now I haven't got anything really left here. I mean, because I used up all the acid and I used up all the base. So what am I going to do to figure out the pH here? So here's our stoichiometric table. Notice we have zero here and we have zero here. But it turns out that while we were producing, uh, or sorry, while we were using up all the OH minus and eliminating all of the CH3COOH. Simultaneously with that, we were actually producing CH3COO minus. So this is where it gets a little tricky. And bear with me for a second while I stand up. Oh, so anyway, I think we can still finish in under two hours. So my bad, I thought we were at the very last step, but we weren't, we were at step three. So anyway, this is so important that I'm actually going to slow back down a little bit. So uh, we're at the point where we have added exactly the same number of moles of base as the number of moles that we started with of the acid. And so you're going to get to a situation like this on a test possibly, and you're going to say, what do I do now? Because I'm out of the acid and I'm out of the base. So you have to realize that while you were adding this base to this acid, you were producing this conjugate base, right? Do you see that? Every time you add one mole of OH minus to one mole of CH3COOH, you're producing one mole of the acetate. Now that may not sound like it's going to help very much, but it actually does. Because what you'll have to do on a test, if you get a problem at the equivalence point for a weak acid strong base titration, you'll just have to remember uh, that you have to use the only thing that you have available which is this, right? Let me actually draw it up here, which is this. So what is that? Well, it's a base, right? It's a weak base, but it's still a base. So it's the only thing you have, so you have to use it. So what you'll have to do is you'll have to think about what could happen to that acetate. So in other words, what I mean is what could it react with? What can we write across the top of an ice table for our equilibrium? And so, I mean, we're, we're really running kind of long here, but I'll let you think about that for a second. I'll just stand here and physically wait while you think about this. <clears throat> what else could we react it with? And don't say CH3COOH because that's gone, at least for the moment. Right? And don't say OH- because it's gone. So what else is there? 
And it's so important that you understand this that I'm just going to sit here for, or stand here. I just stood up actually because I'm my rear end is killing me. <clears throat> uh, what else is there in there that this could react with? Or is there anything else in there? So let me ask it this way. What is always present? Always. And the answer is water, right? So what could we react the acetate with? There's only one thing available, and that's water. <clears throat> so we haven't talked about this yet. This is in part two of the video. But when we react a weak base with water, well, we did actually talk about this before. It's called a KB expression, right? So let me say that again. When you react a weak base with water, you get a KB expression. And we did talk about that in chapter uh, 16. <clears throat> so uh, what you would have to do in this case, even though we haven't talked about this yet, is you'd have to say, OK, uh, what I need to do is I need to write my equilibrium across the top of an ice table. And then <clears throat> in the far top left square or cell, I need to put the concentration of my uh, CH3CO minus. So before we do that, though, uh, we'll come back to that in a moment. What equation or equilibrium are you going to write across the top now of your ice table? In other words, we're going to take this value and convert it to a concentration, and then we're going to move it to our equilibrium or ice table, right? And we need to have that in concentrations, right? So we'll have to have some kind of an equilibrium written across the top here. And then we'll put our uh, initial, and then our change, and then our equilibrium. <clears throat> and this one right here is going to be the CH3COO minus this time. So whatever we get here when we do this uh, to get that converted over to a concentration, that's going to go here. But before we do that, what's the equilibrium? Well, we kind of just said it, right? <clears throat> it's going to be CH3, and I'll actually take the time to write this out because it's so important. Again, this is the hardest step in these titrations. Really, it's the hardest step in all of them because you have to think a lot. <clears throat> so CH3COO minus is what I'm going to write here. And what's the only thing that I can react it with? Water, right? So the next column is just going to be water. Let me try to get that minus sign in. OK, and then water. We're adding it plus water. And I'm going to stop for another few seconds and let you figure out what that's going to produce. OK, so that's supposed to be water. And I'm trying to not take up very much room. It's supposed to be H2O. And then let's just, and then we need one more line here. And then let's just put a line through this one because we don't care about the water because it's a pure liquid. And then over on the right hand side, let's pretend you've got a double headed arrow right there in the middle. And then over here, what are we going to have? And that's what I'd like to stop now and let you think about for a moment. So you tell me what I'm going to get when I when I react <coughs> CH3COO minus plus H2O. So what is the CH3COO minus going to do to the H2O? So tell me what to write over here in this cell right here and this cell right here. And then we're going to wrap up this. As soon as we get through this, we're going to be basically finished. OK, so the answer is in this cell right here, we're going to write what we get when the CH3COO minus reacts with water, which is going to be what? CH3COOH. It's going to pluck a proton off the water and leave the water as what? OH minus. OK, so again, you may see this and you may not see this. So it's for the people that maybe don't see this right now that I'm taking all this time. And then I'm not going to write this out. This is just gonna, I'm just going to write AA for acetic acid, CH3COOH. In other words, this is going to pluck a proton off the water and leave the water as OH minus. OK. Now, coming back over here, what do we write in this cell? We write the number of moles that we have left over, but it's got to be divided by the total volume in order to get it to a molarity. So the total volume here, it looks like, is going to be 100 milliliters of the base that was added and 100 milliliters of the acid that we started with. So what's 100 milliliters plus 100 milliliters? 200 milliliters are 0.2 
liters. So, I mean, it looks like we're going to divide 0.01 moles by 0.2 liters. Again, remember, we have to do this before we put the value in over here because we can't write moles in the ice table. This is the ice table. We have to have concentrations in ice tables. So whatever you get when you divide 0.01, oh, and it's here right in front of me, it's 0.05 molar. So what we do is write in right there, uh, let's see if I can write it, 0 0.5 minus x, <clears throat> excuse me, minus x, and then down at the bottom under equilibrium here, the bottom row, we'll have 0 0.5 uh, that's, um, sorry, that's 0 0.05, my bad. 0 0.05, and then down here at the bottom, we'll have 0 0.05 minus x, which I'm just going to write this as 0 0.05. Right, and then over here, we're going to assume that these both start at 0, because there wasn't any of this stuff before. Now, I realized that we had the OH before, so this can get a little confusing because you're going to say, wait a minute, we, I thought we added OH minus over here. Yeah, yeah, we did. But then we used, so it is confusing. So we used it all up. So now what we're going to do is start to produce it again, right? So anyway, uh, plus X here, I'm not going to write out the rest of this, but plus X, and then the OH minus will also be plus X, and you'll wind up at the bottom down here for both of these with X. And... The uh, K, this is another point that you need to be careful with, because what we just wrote across the top here is no longer a KA expression. It's a KB expression. KB is not the same thing as KA. So for this thing right here, for acetic acid, the KA value, which hopefully you remember, is 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth. But we don't want that one. What we want to do is write it the same way we would if it were a KA expression we're going to wind up with x times x over 0 0.05 equals k, but it's going to be kb this time. And kb, uh, if ka is 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth, then kb is about 5.56 times 10 to the minus tenth, which if you'll forgive me, I'm not going to write all this out because we're right at two hours, and you guys have got to be zapped. Uh, but just it's times 10 to the minus 10th, okay? So that, this thing right here, equals, that number equals x times x over 0.05. Solve for x. So let's just wrap this whole video up right now. Solve for x. Look at your chart. See what x stands for. Um, and it stands for OH minus concentration. So whatever you get for your x, uh, take minus the log of that. And what will that give you? it will give you the POH. And then whatever your POH is, you subtract from 14 to get the pH. And boom, you're done with this step. And then there's one more step here, and I'm just gonna go ahead and wrap this up because it's too long. The last step is when you go past the equivalence point. So what you'll have to do for that one is you'll have to uh, figure out how much more base you have than acid in, in terms of the number of moles, uh, divide it by the total volume, and then take minus the log of that. And that will give you the POH again and subtract it from 14 and you'll be done. So actually, I'm not even going to go through the rest of these slides. There's a whole bunch more slides in here. I didn't intend to go through them all. Uh, I was only going to go through till we got to the part where it starts the third main titration, which is weak base strong acid. So I'm not skipping. Like right now, I'm showing that I'm on slide 98 and I'm showing there were 164 slides. But a lot of the one, like everything after about slide 100 will be done in part two. So don't worry because you're not missing anything. So let's wrap this up. So I'll see you in part two of chapter 17a.